Welcome, welcome everyone to this edition of Biblically Speaking, the podcast. I'm your host, Jared Bowman, and with me as always, back from his trip to a different YouTube channel, is Brian, my co-host, the Bear Summoner, Hayes. Or as I like to tell everybody, Brian Tiberius Hayes. How you doing, buddy? We missed you last well, week. And I had to be somewhere else, and I missed to get to join in what was a great show. Oh, yeah. We had a lot of fun with Chris. Chris did a great job on that topic. I, I think it would have been a lot of fun with you there, but he definitely, as Chris always does, brings the energy. So I wanted to tag yeah. you in on this one. We sat and we brainstormed a little for some time yesterday talking about the next few months of shows we wanted to do and put out and, of course, reacting to what we see going on. But one of the big questions, and, and as you do, that I do the the questions on Fridays, five question Fridays and haven't done one in a couple of weeks because we've been slow on getting some new questions. But one question that has come up over and over again, in fact, I would say it's probably been the most asked question. There's just no way to deal with it in five minutes and cover the history associated with it is, did the Catholic Church give us the Bible? Obvious short answer is no. <laughs> there you go. So questions answered, right? But I thought yeah, we could actually that's spend a capital some time in the, capital O. With an exclamation point at the end. But I thought we could spend some time today talking about how we got the Bible, the claim that the Catholic Church uh, gave us the Bible or influenced even the writing of the Bible, and what canon is and how it got adopted, why some books are part of the Bible and some books aren't. So a lot we want to talk about, but we're going to kick this off from a historical perspective. And I want to start with one very basic question, buddy. Why is this an important topic? Why are so many people wanting to ask about how we got the Bible and did it come from the Catholic Church? I think this is probably one of the big questions people ask. Just yeah. yesterday, somebody asked me, hey, how do we know that the Bible is the word of God? This idea that we walk around and we take this book and we say, hey, this book is God's message, that requires a little bit of explanation. And right. it's important that we have some kind of answers for those questions, of course, but it's also important to understand that one of the largest denominations in the world claims that it's their book, that it's their put together and that it's something that they prepared for us. And there's something really wrong with that claim. We actually have to be able to understand why that claim is so problematic. And in part because the, the basis of that claim gives a sense of an authority to invalidate it. In other words, if, hey, if mm -hmm. I wrote it, I can change it. That's perhaps the biggest problem that comes out of it. You know what it makes me think of when, when I hear that claim, it's, it, and it dovetails with what you just said, it's almost as if the Catholic Church believes that it gives legitimacy to the Bible as opposed to deriving legitimacy from the Bible. And this really gets to the heart of something. And it's something that Brian and I realized as we were brainstorming about future episodes yesterday, that we really needed to touch on some of the denominationalism that's in the world, what, what's really going on with some of these denominations. But it really touches on this idea that does the Catholic Church go all the way back to the first century? Now, that's not this episode. We're going to talk about that in later episodes. But the idea that somehow... The Catholic Church, and, and part of that goes back to their claim, which I just did a Daily Bible Insights video on yesterday on Matthew 16. I guess this drops Friday, so I did it Monday on Matthew 16, that it gives the whole idea that Peter being authority, given authority by Jesus to oversee the church is somehow that the Catholic Church giving legitimacy to Scripture. But yet, the Apostle Paul says Scripture isn't, is given by God that scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be equipped for every good work, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So regardless of who you think may have written each book, Paul says God is the author, not any man or any doctrine you may associate with that man. So maybe it's worth our time just to step back and say, what does it mean when the Catholic Church claims that it's responsible for the Bible? Right. If you sit down and you Google Catholic Church gave us the Bible, one of the things you're probably going to pull up is there was a well-known book written 
by an author who the name of the book is The Bible is a Catholic Book. Or actually, yeah, The Bible is a Catholic Book. And of course, it's a, a an attempt to demonstrate through Catholic theology that Catholicism is biblical Christianity and that all of the authors of the New Testament were Catholics, which is a, also part of that claim. And that the Catholic Church both brings together what we call the canon. We'll have to define that word here in a second. The canon mm-hmm. of the Bible, as well as authorized both its inception as well as authorized its collection. And those are all claims that can be demonstrated to be false. Those are all claims that can be shown to be inaccurate claims. And in fact, what, some of the things that we're going to be shocked to find is not, this one isn't going to shock many people. Number one, Catholic Church doesn't follow the Bible. That's not a shock. Number two, it might be a shock for some people to find out that at some point in, in Catholicism, the Bible end up a banned book, which is counterintuitive if the Bible is a Catholic book. The Catholic Church banned the Bible from common consumption during the Council of Trent. There's, there's just a lot to consider here. And as I said, it's several claims that the Catholic Church makes about the authorship being Catholic, the collection of those books being Catholic that can be demonstrated to be inaccurate. There, there's so much to this that you think about guys like William Tyndale that were burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. There's a book that my dad gave me years ago called As Wide as the Waters that was talking about the influence of people who died in order to translate the Bible and bring it to the masses. And exactly what you just said there, that trying to keep the book out of the hands of the people should indicate that denomination, at least at some point in history, was very afraid of the average person understanding what was written in the Bible. That it did because it doesn't, the Bible doesn't legitimize the, that's, uh, that's the word I'm looking for here. The the Bible doesn't legitimize the Catholic Church. It doesn't legitimize its function. It doesn't legitimize its hierarchy or any of the precepts that it puts out. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Now, you mentioned understanding canon. Now, that's C-A-N-O-N and not C-A-N-O-N. So not the explosive kind. What's a canon, Brian? Canon kind of refers to the idea of a straight line. In fact, the word canon from a shooting device, I made a shooting noise in case anybody wonder where that noise was. It it all actually is connected to the word, the idea of something that's going straight out like that. And the idea is it's a series of books that line up with each other insofar as they're teaching an idea. And we use that okay. word to refer to the books that, that were inspired by God and constitute what we call the word of God. The Bible's not one book. Uh, most people probably understand this. The Bible is, is not, it's not even one library. It's two libraries of books. The right. Old Testament is the first library. The New Testament is the second library. And there's a number of books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, uh, a number of books in each library. And that collection of books has a consistency of theme that we call the canon, the idea of those books that we can have confidence were inspired by God. Now, one of the ways that you see that is references. In fact, if you've been following the daily insight Bible videos that I put out one chapter a day. Right now, we're going through the Gospel of Matthew. We'll go through the New Testament by the end of the year. That if you've been following those videos, you'll know that I highlight any time there is a quotation from the Old Testament in the New Testament. I tell you, this is where this quotation comes from, or sometimes it's from multiple places. But that's what Brian is talking about, is that the legitimacy of one uh, shows the legitimacy of the other, that there's a connection between the two. And so you've got prophecy and fulfillment. You've got quotations uh, that are made in the Old Testament that are referenced in the New Testament. You've got things like Peter at the end of 2 Peter calling the writings of Paul scripture. You've got Paul quoting Jesus at different times. And so you've got these statements that indicate, okay, there is, there's some sort of common uh, authorship here. There's a line that connects all of these books together. Right. The Bible gives us the idea that anything that is proven to be true is proven by two or three witnesses. And that idea is important in establishing what it is that we're talking about with canon. And it's important to get a sense that the books that we have, both Old Testament and New Testament, have testimonies amongst each other about their veracity. When we make the point, as you said, that they quote each other, they reference each other, but they're also thematic. 
the same way. It was easy for us, for example, there were a lot of books written in the second and third century that were written by people we call Gnostics, by people we call aesthetics. And it was easy to Mm -hmm. discern that they weren't part of that canon. They had weird ideas. They contradicted things that are said in the scriptures. They, they, you know, basically weren't supported by these, this concept of coding back and forth. So we could say, we could have a confidence to say that those books weren't part of that. There's a few books right on the fringe that were written at the end of the first century. And what's helpful with a few of those, we have like the letter of first Clement. Is is it the letter to the Philippians by Polycarp, I believe. Those guys told us they're not inspired. They said, we're not of the inspired group. Finally, of course, like I said, anything written after the first century, the whole concept of apostolic succession that the Catholic Church puts a lot of weight on, but the New Testament denies, that indicates for us there was nothing inspired written after the first century. Ironically, because the Catholic Church claims to still have an apostolic succession, but they acknowledge nothing new was written after the first century. You catch the significance of that state. They're saying, hey, we're, we have this authority, but by the way, we just have never used it. Well, there's something more going on there. Yeah. Let me give you some dates. Let's take a look at this and get into the meat of the claim that the Catholic Church gave us the Bible. Now, there's two big things. One of them we're going to talk about in a little bit, and that is the assumption that all of the writers were Catholic. And I think, I think 2 Timothy 3 gives us a problem with that because it says that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And so the, the writer of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. It, it's in the hands of men that are pinning it, but it's, it is given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul did not sit down and say, okay, what do I need to write today to the church at Philippi? Or what do I need to write to the church at Ephesus? That it's being dictated to him by God. And he basically acknowledges that at the beginning of every letter when he says, grace and peace be unto you, or in some form of the, that language. The first date that I have of the Catholic Church being associated, these are councils and synods and things like that, but is the Council of Rome. That's 382. And it was led by Pope Damascus I. I don't know who that is. And that supposedly defined the Bible canon. It gave them the loose canon to work with. The second is the Council of Hippo, H-I-P-O, in 393, so just a few years later. And Hippo, the Council of Hippo approved a biblical canon that is similar to what's called the Catholic canon today. Now, one of the things that I didn't look at that I probably should have is, is does the Catholic canon include the Apocrypha? Do you know that? I know it's that included in most Catholic That is a fantastic Catholics. question. They call it Deuterocanon, which kind of means it's set apart from the canon. But to be fair, that, but that but expression that, that word literally means second canon. <laughs> yeah, it literally means second canon. And it's the idea that it that implies the idea that it's a sub- uh, canonical text. It, being deuterocanonical would probably indicate that, that it's not seen as on the par of being in canon. Okay. So then you've got the Carthage councils, which go from 397 to 419. There are apparently two during that roughly 20 year, a little more span, a 22 year span. And they approved the same canon as the Council of Hippo. You have the Council of Florence, which is 1431 to 1449. They must have really liked hanging out in Florence because there didn't seem to be a break there. And they affirmed the biblical canon. And then you have 1545 and to 1563, the Council of Trent, that Trent affirmed the biblical canon as an article of faith. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that is about the same time that William Tyndale was killed for bringing the Bible to the people, translating it into common English. So that actually would have been right before the Council of Trent. So 1536 is when he was killed. What we're seeing is that the Catholic Church in this time frame is really struggling to try to get control of what is the Bible, who can have the Bible. They even made it an article of faith. What does that mean, an article of faith? That's a great question. And maybe I'm not actually uh, completely qualified to answer the official definition of an article of faith. It is a a matter of faith substance. In other words, Catholicism views faith a little different than the Bible does. The Bible talks about faith as faith that comes by hearing the word of God, faith without works is dead. 
But Catholicism has a concept of faith that the church owns faith, that the church has faith. So that it, it, when somebody who's Catholic talks about faith, they're talking about Catholicism. So an article of faith means it's something that the Catholic church owns. The Catholic church owns marriage, according to them. The Catholic church owns baptism. The Catholic church owns communion. Catholic church owns the scriptures. I got to say carefully because it's a very convoluted reasoning sometimes on these things, but typically articles of faith similar to sacraments are something that the Catholic church has a possession. Yeah. Required. It, it's something it, that's part of their faith. It's requirement, the assumption of ownership of, and also somehow creed. And, but like you said, it's very difficult to pin down. It, it's like the idea of, and we're going to talk about this in another episode of whether or not they promote the worship of Mary. They'll tell you, no, 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 no. We don't worship Mary. We just pray to her so that she can intercede on our behalf and thank her when she does intercede. Okay, I'm very confused by that statement, and it's intentionally confusing. It is to say no so you don't get a heresy out of it, but or you don't become you know, heretical with some other things that you've said, but essentially you're saying yes at the same time. And I think that's one of the struggles that most people have when they're dealing with this is it's put, it's put to us in a way that it is affirmed and denied at the same time. But as an article of faith, what they're saying right. is if you don't accept this canon and the ownership of this canon and the, our testimony of these being the books, then you are a heretic, that you aren't with the creed, you are outside of the Catholic Church. And that could affect people in a lot of ways, that basically that would have invalidated marriage and things like that in the eyes of the Catholics. Ultimately, what they're saying by the time you get to the Council of Trent is we have ownership of the Bible, that, that we own the Bible and we decide what's part of it, what's not part of it. And ultimately, where would they have derived that kind of legitimacy from? What gave them you know, the right to make those kinds of statements? Of course, and, and drawing together these councils, one of the things I'm going to say here that could be shocking to a lot of people, certainly it's shocking if you're Catholic, most Christians, actually most secular historians aren't going to be surprised by this. But Catholicism draws these councils together, and they're all, the, not all the councils, but the most authoritative ones are going to be in the last part of the fourth century moving onward. And that's after the emperor Constantine has given Christianity, a legitimacy. And, and that's typically what we point to from a Christian standpoint, from a historical standpoint, as when the Catholic church was born. Some people put it a little later. Some people say it's, it's as late as 500 AD, whenever the bishop of the church in Rome is put over the bishop of the church in Constantinople. And even the, and the Greek Orthodox church would even argue that with good cause to say that it wasn't actually that the Catholic church doesn't appear until the great schism of the 10th century. Like I said, for a lot of people, that's a shock. Catholicism though, does not exist before let's say 200 AD of any form. A form of it is starting to come about, but at the end of the second, third, fourth century, we have an amalgamation of the Roman government and these church synods, these church groups that have been coming together for about 100, 150 years, forming diocese, that's a word I think we're familiar with, and forming these groups like this. But to step in and take control of the Bible was a real power move, especially when Constantine is saying, hey, I want copies of the Bible. And if you can control that, we can see it as a power move. Uh, you, if you can control that, these councils all pop up to step in and take control of that. Before that, though, you don't have these kinds of councils that are saying, hey, what does the Bible say? And there's an important reason for that. Number one, the important reason is there's no Catholic Church. Catholic Church doesn't exist in any kind of recognizable way that it could have stepped up after the second century. Also, though, that the canon had already been agreed upon in a very generic sense long before the Catholic Church steps up and says, hey, we're making it an official. We're making it an official. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of important points to consider here. We ask the question is the Catholic Church claims that the writers of the New Testament are Catholic. There is no Catholic Church. It's not mentioned in the Bible, obviously. Anything yeah. about the Catholic and we're gonna, Church, and we're the Pope, another, we're another step. Get more into that in just a second. Uh, but we're also going to cover that in another study. But something, uh, go, go ahead. I, I sidetracked you, but I just want to let people no. know we're not touching on that right this second. We're going to come back to that thought. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to come to several of these topics here in the future as well. We want to cover them a little more thoroughly. But to be clear, like I said, it, the claim that the authors of the New Testament are Catholic. 
false, patently false. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't have even understood what that meant, let alone they certainly wouldn't have agreed with it. Number two, that you've already said this several times, Jared, but let's say it one more time. The New Testament claims it is the Holy Spirit that moves men, not a church that moves men to draft the scriptures. Second Timothy 3, 16, mm-hmm. 17, second Peter chapter one, what, verse 18 and 19. We have these constant statements that it isn't people that are writing this. And it's certainly not a church that's writing this. There's nothing in there that you could draw from that. But of course, like I said, there is no Catholic church that could have been writing the Bible. So number one, certainly not the Catholic church that wrote it. Number two, if the Catholic church claims that they are the ones that then authorized what books it was, that's also false. That the books that the Catholic church stamped out and said, these are the authorized books had already been agreed upon. Particularly, you could say the Old Testament. It's almost absurd to for the Catholic Church to try to say that they are, are responsible for the creation of the Old Testament because the Old Testament had been agreed upon long before Christ. That was something that we can read about in preceding times, and there's something significant about that as well. Yeah, and we're going to cover all of that. Now, you said something I want to touch on, and that was the idea of the diocese, that the diocese are something, and this really is, the beginning of the Catholic Church is the late 200s, early 300s. What that was the the legitimizing of Christians to have some administrative rights over their over over the practice of religion in a certain area, and it was Rome, pagan Rome, that did that. They created the diocese. I just looked it up in the Edict of Milan in 313. That's what created the diocese. And from this, you begin to have bishops popping up that are over cities and not local congregations, as we see the pattern in the New Testament, where Peter says in 1 Peter 5, shepherd the flock among you. Bishops popping up over regions at this point. And that's the birth of the Catholic mindset and the hierarchy. Now, one of the things that you and I talked about yesterday and it's, this gets to why are they doing this? What is the claim to legitimacy? What happened historically that makes any of this possible? The reason behind a lot of this is that it legitimized their claims to do things like anoint kings and start wars. And it right. was in, in many ways, uh, I was just trying to look up Charlemagne. Let's see, you were telling me a story about Charlemagne yesterday. And, yeah, it's 790, uh, 799 or 800, Christmas Day. Yeah. Charlemagne is proclaimed by Pope, do we say Pope Gregory? And it's a fascinating story because in that proclamation, the, the, there's a great book by a gentleman named Peter uh, De Rosa, and a Catholic writer, by the way. And uh, he describes the story of this crowning of Charlemagne being something that Charlemagne was livid about because the Pope is- Pope Leo. Is Pope Leo, I'm sorry, not Leo, Pope Gregory, Leo I apologize. The and so Gregory Pope Leo, by crowning him, Charlemagne is in a position where if he accepts the crown, he also accepts that the Pope had the power to crown him so that the Pope supersedes his authority. If he denies the crown, he doesn't get to be the Holy Roman Emperor, which is the way he's going to tie in the dynastic power. The the Roman Empire had been gone for a long time. And so this claim to to that authority would give him an air of authority. So he either has to accept or deny it and he accepts it. But the like I said, it's understood through history that he was very upset about this. It really is interesting because we have, I want to say there was another Pope Stephen, or maybe I've got my stories mixed up there, but several of the popes are exerting this power over kings at that time period. Stay away from the Borgia, right? And stay away from the Borgia popes, for sure. What's fascinating, though, is that in the 7th, 8th, ninth century, the Catholic Church is in this flux position where they're trying to become more than a church and become the thing that authorizes kings. And so we see this exertion of power. But this is also the time period where you start hearing things like Peter was the first pope. Again, to legitimize yes. that authority, you, you st- a lot of the Catholic traditions that we're very familiar with today are popping up in that time period. One of the ones that was dismissed later, was something called the Donation of Constantine. It was a forged will, supposedly from Emperor Constantine, where he passed the Roman Empire to the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church pointed to it for centuries as saying, hey, look, we own the Roman Empire. It was a forgery centuries after Constantine, and yet it was submitted as a legitimate document. There's a lot of change that happens from those early councils that gave, and this isn't, this is going to connect back to the Bible here. 
there's a lot of change that happens in the Catholic Church from those old early councils where we're going to define this. And then you have the, of course, the di- the diocese, the definition of the canon, the supposedly the legitimizing of the Catholic Church by Constantine. But after it begins to crown kings, that Charlemagne being an example of that, you're 200, 250 years away from the first crusade, or maybe closer to 300 at that point. And basically, the Catholic Church, through their claim of ownership of the Bible and the canon, and essentially their ownership of faith, has set themselves up as the preeminent government in the world. And that's really what this is about. This is not tinfoil hat conspiracy. If you're a history buff, you can find this with very quick Google searches. You can find this with very quick just to look at wit, at the relationship between events, it it took me maybe five minutes while Brian was talking over a couple of different exchanges, just piece together the timeline. It's something I just thought about while we were working on this or while we were recording. But here's the thing. All of this stands and falls based on their claim of ownership of Scripture. And as you pointed out, one of the big claims to ownership of Scripture is this circular logic. That we own the scripture, we own the canon, we get to say what's in, what's out. It's heresy in in the 1540s, because they burned William Tyndale to the stake just before then, that it's heresy if you do something with the Bible or print it in a language that we don't want it printed in or distribute it in a way that we don't want it distributed. It's heresy. That is all about legitimizing Catholicism as a world power. It's not about taking Jesus to people. But it's all based on this circular logic that that the authors of the Bible, that particularly the New Testament, were Catholic. And that was one of the big claims we ran into yesterday was that the authors of the Bible were Catholic. Immediately, you've got a problem with the first you know, more than half the Bible because it's Old Testament, right? And we know that before the turn of the first century, the Jewish canon of scripture and, and the, apo- the Apocrypha is not considered part of that, that, the, that they didn't consider it part of that, that Josephus talks about 22 books in the middle first century that were, part of the, that were part of the Jewish canon of scripture. The reason why he talks about 22 and not 39 is because the minor prophets are grouped together and the first five books of the Bible were grouped together into one book. And so you have two books instead of 17. But essentially, you've got the 39 books that we would recognize as the Old Testament have been, na- not even essentially, they've been nailed down for, by that point in time, probably more than 500 years or 400 years. They have been nailed down. That's considered closed. That's not given to you by the Catholic Church. So then we're only focusing on the New Testament. So what's the big problem with the claim that New Testament New Testament authors were Catholic. One of the big ones that you mentioned is you don't see any type of arrangement of the Catholic Church until, and I I looked it up when the first diocese was created, until about 300 AD. But what are some of the other big issues with claiming that New Testament authors were Catholic and claiming this line of succession? You mentioned the apostolic succession and things like that. So what are some of the big claims they're making and what are some of the big issues with that 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 would deal with this claim of legitimacy of the Bible coming from the Catholic Church? And where do we start? There's just a lot to be said (laughs) about that claim. I guess let's just for a second say, what is the Catholic Church? It's this worldwide organization with a pope at the top, with cardinals beneath that, a college of cardinals that, that are a subset to the pope. The bishops that sit beneath that system who oversee diocese in different areas and then down below that, the priesthood. That system, the very first time you have this concept of a priesthood system coming up, some might say Ignatius is the earliest reader about that. Ignatius certainly is problematic because he breaks apart the words in the Bible that are meant to be the same, the words episkopos and presbyteros, which elders and overseers in the New Testament, they're used as synonyms of each other constantly, all through mm-hmm. the New Testament. Um, and he breaks them apart to give a structure. Now, that's not the Catholic Church yet, but it's something that the Catholic Church will later build upon. What are the right. things that make the Catholic Church? Like I said, sacraments, all these pope, all these things. None of those things existed in the first century. There was no pope. 
In fact, as I said momentarily uh, a moment ago, there's no claim that Peter was the first pope for hundreds and hundreds of years after the first century. That's not an idea. You, as you said, you just did a show on why Peter can't be the first pope, why the whole idea mm -hmm. of a pope is quite literally contrary to the concept of scripture. Peter can't be the head of the church, especially when the New Testament says many times Jesus is the head of the church. So none of those things really work out. The word Catholic means universal. And the idea, it, it, it's not really, as I said, it's a Latin word. It's not going to be used in the New Testament. So it's absent in its use. But mm -hmm. the idea is that these writers would have saw themselves as Christians, not Catholic. That, that the mm -hmm. concepts here, that the, the word Catholic is not going to be pulled up for many centuries as an idea. Th these people can't be Catholic. They can't be Catholic because they would have held the Catholic Church as part of the great apostasy that they were talking about. They were talking about an apostasy, and, and we have this scheduled for a show later on, an apostasy right. where one person takes control of the church. That's Catholicism. Or one person takes titles like father, where one person forbids some people to marry. And like I said, we can point some of these things to God. Hand. Yes, as the, as in the place of God in the church. That's Catholicism, <clears throat> as much as it can be described. So mm -hmm. if you want to say there is a reference to Catholicism, it would be in the great apostasy, the great falling away. That's Catholicism. And, and like I said, I would even hesitate to say that because the apostasy they're talking about was sooner than that. And the Catholic Church won't pop up for centuries. It's not going to come up until the Roman yeah. Empire authorizes Christianity to be a religion. But isn't there a tie when you follow the cult of the living divas, the worship of Caesar through Rome? Isn't there ultimately a tie in, from that to the evolution of Catholicism? that you have Rome legitimizing religion. You have, basically, there was a compromise that was supposed to compartmentalize Christianity. And I think that was the Milan edict that, that I talked about at Memory Serves, where dioceses were set up. Yeah, the edict like, of Milan. Supposed to, the edict of Milan is supposed to compartmentalize Christianity. Okay, okay, you can be, you can have your bishop, you can be in this area, and you don't have to worship this way, I think is how that works. I could be wrong. I'm trying to remember all this off the top of my head. That, but there was the sense that secular government legitimized faith. And in many ways that what he's talking about in second Thessalonians two, that great apostasy that it points at, at least in that direction, maybe not specifically. And I think it's also a mistake to assume that just because there's one mentioned, it's like the end of revelation. Is that talking about end times or something that happened with Rome or it's really more of just a picture behind the curtain of what's really going on. And you can assume that these kinds of things are always happening in the world. But when you really begin to look at what it says, it does tend to mirror what the Catholic Church was doing. And what's interesting is in Second Thessalonians, Paul calls him the man of lawlessness. I don't think that Paul or the Holy Spirit wastes words. And so when you go back to Matthew chapter 7 and you think about how Jesus said, depart from me in 7 and 21, you who practice lawlessness, those who would say they did miracles in his name and cast out demons in his name, he's going to say, I didn't know you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, I don't think he's specifically talking about, about the Catholic Church there. I think he's talking about Jews that were claiming to be part of God's kingdom as he's teaching the doctrine of the kingdom. But it's almost as if the Holy Spirit is reaching back to that and saying, it's the same kind of lawlessness. What was the cure for that lawlessness in Matthew 7? It was whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to the wise man who built his house upon the rock. So you've got the wise man who builds his house upon the sayings or builds upon the sayings of Jesus. The sayings of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, that's the rock. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a second because there's an important tie to Matthew 16 there that really blows up the idea that Peter is the first pope. But that idea of lawlessness, the man who is without law, who's not restrained by God, and the people that were going to follow him because they did not love the truth, that's a big thought. If they're going to follow after someone representing himself as a representative of God because they don't love the truth, he's going to seat himself in the temple, he's going to do all of these things in Second Thessalonians 2. The Holy Spirit calls him the man of lawlessness. Do with that what you will. There's something profound to consider about what you said, this emergence of a Catholic church in the fourth century with the legalization by Constantine and such. I always mm -hmm. like to point out that this term pontificus maximus, 
that is the one of the titles of the Pope today and has been for quite some time. That was originally the Roman title for the chief of all the pagan priests. Just lifted right out of Roman paganism oh. and dropped right on top of the Pope. So, oh, man, I mean, it was gonna, we'll definitely put that in the Pope episode. <laughs> yeah, no, it's and it's and it's really remarkable to think of this idea that, you know, again, yeah, uh, there's is. some fascinating history around this time that when the Edict of Milan and later Christianity be made, the uh, Edict of Milan legalizes Christianity and then Christianity's made the, uh, I forgot the name of the edict, the Christianity's made the official religion of Rome. There were a lot of people that knew that meant that in the times past, the most powerful positions in Rome had been these pagan priests. That was transferring to these heads of churches that, again, going back to Ignatius, had started to emerge. There's actually stories that in Rome, they were killing each other to become, yeah, uh, they were killing each other to become the bishop so that they could have that power. That's how uh, powerful they were. And they say that's the very first time you even hear an inkling that maybe Peter had been the first pope, that the claim was Peter died here. So I'm really just taking over Peter's position as the bishop of Rome. And that kind of is the earliest hint. It's not going to come out for a little while that maybe Peter had been a pope because of this battle for power. And like I said, clearly, if they're killing each other for this role, and by the way, of a huge number of popes throughout history murdered by their successors. Wow. To me, that's a, the Bible says you're going to know a tree by its fruit, right? The popes, mm-hmm. if you want to be pope, there's a significant chance you're going to be murdered by the guy that's going to follow you. Now, nah, it hasn't happened in the last century or so that we know of. There's actually a couple of strange deaths of popes in the 20th century that uh, are questionable. Read some of the, you read up on some of the, the P20 stuff uh, in the 20th century, uh, how the Catholic church got in with the mob and some of that might have happened that the cat, the bank of the Vatican was used to, to outsource mob money. Like I said, that's not a conspiracy theory. That was actually trials that happened in the country of Italy on the 20th century. So like I said, you get a sense, even today, popes, it's not an easy position because the guys around you might want it really badly. So it's always been a remarkably carnal, destructive position. So let's talk for just a second before we go too much further into that thought. When yeah, I don't want to go into that. You're right. Yeah, not that thought, but the legitimacy of succession. Not secession. That's Texas. Succession. <laughs> Yikes. First, first reported <laughs> to you by man. Oh no. Texas. I grew up in Texas, buddy. Texas has been reporting that for at least 47. <laughs> okay. But before we go into sort of the legit the legitimacy that the Catholic Church wants to take from from Peter dying in Rome and things like that. When do we, what do we know about the early churches and the canon of the Bible? Okay, that's a great question. One thing we understand is that early churches in the writings of the New Testament themselves relate an idea that it wasn't as though you had single letters that had value, but it was a collective source. Uh, For example, we've already mentioned this, but in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter makes a reference to the writings of Paul, writings plural. He calls Mm -hmm. those writings scripture, and he is telling a group of Christians they need to be working on those things. They need to be studying those things. One of the the concepts of the New Testament, Paul writing to the, the Colossians tells them they need to share this writing with other churches. One of the concepts of the New Testament that's super important to understand is that as these books are being written, as these letters, and their letters or books, however you want to call them, that the expectation is, number one, they're going to be copied. They're going to be distributed and that they're going to be studied upon as scripture, holy writing. In other words, that, and, and this is the, the consistent claim that this is a holy writing. This is from God. You need to listen to this and you need to share it with others as a collective source of writings, a collective source of writing. From the get go, the New Testament was meant to be viewed like the Old Testament as a mm-hmm. school or a library of writings that we oftentimes point to Jude verse three as being the end of it when he says once and for all delivered, that the that right. the concepts here are conclusive at the end of the first century. We don't have an open canon that's constantly being added to. By the way, the Catholic Church doesn't disagree with that, uh, which is ironic right. uh, um, because the, yeah, they do have the catechism. They do have the magisterium. Right. Again, stories for another day. But this idea of they, a closed they canon. They don't have another. 
but they did. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it. right. That's right. That's uh, in a nutshell, that's our discussion of Catholicism. But go ahead. But the whole idea is by the end of the first century, it's clear that there's a consistency of writing. Now, as uh, what's interesting is the two letters I just mentioned about the Holy, the idea that they're not written by men, but by the Holy Spirit and the idea of taking these writings as scripture are both written as also the last letters of these men as they're about to die. Second, so in other words, second Timothy is Paul's last letter. He says at the end, he's about to die. Second Peter is Peter's last letter. He says he's about to die. Mm -hmm. And in one way, the theme of both of those letters is what has been written, i.e. up through now, is, is sufficient for you. This is Peter's statement in the opening part of Second Peter, that all things pertaining to life and godliness are given by this knowledge, by the things that are being written out. These mm -hmm. letters, these writings consist of the totality. What, what do we know? Written in the first century, these letters, the, the letters and writings of the first century that have that cross-reference system consist of the totality of information given according to the apostles of Jesus Christ, the totality of information necessary for all things pertaining to life and godliness. That, like I said, that's a substantive yeah. idea. That's like getting a letter from somebody who's working on the Constitution saying, hey, today is July 4th, 1793. We finished everything. We're done. Everything's been written that we need. It's all prepared. What would you know? You would know that the Constitution had been agreed upon at that time. Mm -hmm. As they're describing this, you get this letter and they're saying this, you would know it's been agreed upon. So number one, the writers of the New Testament saw their writings as part of a collection of writings, like the Old Testament was a collection of writings that right. was finished uh, by the, uh, at the latest, by the first end of the first century. So that's tremendously important to know about canon. The canon itself, the view of itself is that it was finished by the end of the first century. If it's written in the second century, it's not canon. We know that. And what's really cool, I mentioned this before, is a lot of these guys that were men that were in the church and seem to be faithful Christians that are writing at the end of the first century, they're saying stuff like, yeah, I'm writing this letter because this is what the apostles said. And they were inspired. In case we're not inspired, they were inspired. That's what Clement, mm -hmm. I mentioned Clement before, Polycarp, a lot of these writers. So it's important for us to understand that there's a gap at the end of the first century towards the beginning of the second century of people saying we're not inspired. Now, in the second century, a bunch of stuff starts popping up. A bunch of false letters start popping up. And that's right. to some people, that clouds the view. Really, not really. Um, what we know is that they agree on a canon uh, pretty universally. There's a little story here about a guy named Marcion. So Marcion lives, I think, around 150 AD. Marcion comes along and says, hey, in, in churches that I go to, we're only going to use certain books. And he starts tearing apart the New Testament. And all these guys are saying, wait, that's not the New Testament we agree upon. What does that imply? There was an agreed on New Testament. That There was right. a, an agreed on collection of books that were the New Testament. And that's an important thing for us to understand. We know that keep, there keep are mind, lists. You're talking about, keep in mind, you're talking about people that would have been alive at the time or shortly after some of these things were written. That's right. You're talking That's about, right. about Jude yeah. and Revelation and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. You're talking about things that were really close. Paul and Peter died a little earlier. I, I get that. But they're saying, look, just about everything that you need is already here. That, that if you think about books that are written at the end of the 1st century, you've got 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, Jude, looks like that. That yeah, Revelation may have been written earlier. There's some debate on that, but whichever. That... You're talking about there could very well have been people alive when this is being discussed who saw the apostles, knew the writings, and knew them well enough to say, yeah, John wrote that. So it's interesting that, like I said, we have lists of, that were passed around with churches. My suspicion is there are probably lists where, hey, what are you guys, what are you reading? This is in the middle of the second mm -hmm. century where these new books are popping up and they're saying, hey, look, it's only these books. What are the books? They're the books that we call the New Testament. When the Catholic Church is convening these councils 200 years later, uh, 100, yeah, 200 years later, that's right. They're just saying, yeah, these lists, that's what we agree upon. That's what they were saying are the official books of the New Testament. And again, I wouldn't even go so far as to say 
early on that their goal is to, they are coalescing control, but some of that is to control thinking that they don't like. Some of that's bad thinking. Unfortunately, some of it was good thinking that they were trying to kill out. A great example of that would be some of the thinking about original sin and stuff that's popping up in the fourth century that Augustine of Hippo mm-hmm. is the father of. I, I sometimes like to say Augustine of Hippo is the uh, intellectual or philosophical father of the Catholic Church. Constantine is the is the constructive father of the Catholic Church. I just make those terms up. But the point is they have, they're really the ones that give birth to what we think of as Catholicism. Really can't call it that beforehand. Let me give you some dates here and, and get you to expound on this a little bit. By the middle of the second century, you're AD 100 by at least the middle 130s up to 150, there was a core group of the New Testament is universally recognized being Acts, the 13 epistles of Paul, Hebrews, 1 Peter, 1 John, and Revelation. At that time, the books that were in dispute, now in dispute does not mean that they're doubting doesn't doesn't always mean they're doubting the legitimacy of the authorship. They may be doubting whether or not they should be considered part of the New Testament or were they just a personal writing, which I think is probably the case with Second and Third John. But you had in dispute Second Peter, Jude, James, Second and Third John. Basically, what you have here is you've got the core of the New Testament by the end of the first century going into the second century. The church, the, the churches that were around then knew, yeah. This is inspired. There was some back and forth over Second Peter, Jude, James, Second, Third John. That doesn't mean that those books were not written at the time. It doesn't mean that people were doubting the authorship, although some probably were. Or in fact, I know some doubted the authorship. But there, but it simply means that there was a question of whether or not they should be considered part of the Bible. And universally, they be, they became accepted as part of the Bible. That doesn't change their inspiration. These are qu- questions that men raised about this, not questions that God is raising about this. I wanted to get you to, to expound on that a little bit. Yeah. For example, the book of Hebrews, the author of the book of Hebrews isn't exactly clear. A lot of times we think it was Paul, but Paul usually tells us he's the writer in his writings right off the top. So there's always a question of, is it possible that if Paul wrote it, why didn't he sign it? We're not sure. So there was a question there. It wasn't a question as to whether or not there was anything in it inspired. A huge chunk of the book of Hebrews is pulling from the Old Testament to show how these prophecies are revealed. Important because we don't have a clarity of that revelation in other places in the New Testament. In other words, the book of Hebrew gives us a few things that are really important, like the high priesthood of Jesus and an explanation of that's really intricate to our understanding that we can walk away with. But there was a question, who wrote it? You mentioned that mm-hmm. sometimes when letters were written to personal people, so so sometimes New Testament letters are written to broad audiences like James and First Peter. Hey, everybody, they both have a to the dispersion, to the pilgrims. That's every Christian. And sometimes it was to a church or a group of churches, but sometimes like Philemon and Third John and even Second Timothy, or First Timothy too, they're written to an individual, to one person. Is that an inspired first person or is it? And of course, like I said, our conclusion is but must be inspired because it, they have that nature to them of inspiration and right. uh, written by people that were inspired. If nothing else, they're not going to be uninspired or they're not going to be false. We can have that confidence too and, and be certain they were written. Uh, they're testified to. And again, that's the big idea is testified to. In the second century, we have people writing and they're saying, hey, remember what Paul said in... Um, mm-hmm. That's, by the way, one of the neat things about the scriptures that somebody says, how do we know this is what they really wrote? Because they're quoting them 50 years, 100 years later, exactly right. the way we understand them. that the, in fact, somebody once said, if we had no manuscripts of the New Testament, we would nearly have enough information based on quotations in the second and third century to put it together because we would have them having quoted so much of the New Testament. Somebody comes along and says, hey, I don't think the last part of Mark is original. We can actually go and say, oh yeah, Irenaeus is quoting it here. and." It is original. That's why we have such a great confidence in the Bible. It's not just that the Bible is, has these ancient books. That's really cool. But it also has these ancient quotes that also make you think, you can't question that it is what it is. So let's go back and finish up that thought on this assumption. We talked about it being circular logic, but this assumption that the 
early Christian writers, so we're talking the author, the, the writers of the Bible, that they would have identified themselves as Catholics. And, and the Catholic Church does that because it assumes the legitimacy. They'll tell you this is the church that, that was established in, at Pentecost and that this is the church that Peter's the Pope of, that this is, and all of those claims, as you've mentioned, they don't show up in the Bible. They show up 400 years after the Bible, right? Some of them as late as 600 years after the Bible. This idea that the Catholic Church is the oldest church in the world, that, that the Catholic Church is the biggest church in the world, that there's somebody once told me a billion Catholics can't be wrong. Jesus <laughs> said that wide is the way, broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Many are going in by it. That the size of the number of people that believe in it, this is not salvation by democracy. That the size of the number of the number of people that believe in something does not legitimize it. One of the things I want to touch on, and I know we're going to do a whole episode on this later, is does Jesus pronounce Peter as having any special authority in Matthew 16? I haven't done a screen share yet, so you know I got to do a screen share because it just wouldn't be a biblically speaking podcast if we did not do a screen share. Of course. We run into the claim that, you know, I actually, I'm going to have to be careful because uh, I want to say that uh, Peter's uh, is first mentioned uh, whenever they're appointing the bishops after Constantine's Edict of Milan in that circumstance. So it'd be the fourth century before you would hear anything like that, but it's not even official for some time after that. Okay. Yeah. Because the date I had in my head was closer to 600, but looking at this, so we're going to look at Matthew 16 here. This is where Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And this incidentally I did a whole Daily Bible Insights video on this, that this is, that there's all kinds of Daniel 7, Son of Man references that all over Matthew 16. And that's what Jesus is asking them. He, he says, first of all, who do people say that the Son of Man is? The apostles seem to understand that he's talking about himself. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he asks them the follow-up question, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you also that you are Peter upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, there's a Greek argument for why this doesn't really legitimize Peter as the rock that this is built on. I think it convolutes things a little bit and, and probably isn't as strong as most people think it is, but. Peter's name that Jesus gave him is Petros, which means tiny stone. And the rock is Petra, which means mountainous or like a boulder or something of that nature. But here's the thing. There, I'm going to give you a few other reasons why this, is an, why this is an issue. Number one, we know that the disciples, based on Jesus washing their feet in John 13, are fighting about who is the greatest in the kingdom all the way up until the crucifixion of Jesus. It doesn't make any sense for Peter to have been legitimized as having authority over the other apostles in some kind of way, being the primary vicar of Christ. It makes no sense to claim that if they're, if, and fight about it later, because Jesus has already told. Him. Number two, and this is a big one, the vicar of Christ, that, that's one of the terms for the pope, is supposed to have legitimate, uh, uh, the, the, the papal infallibility, that's a doctrine that's hard to pin down like a lot of things the Catholic Church talks about. He's, there's supposed to be a level of infallibility with him when it comes to important things. And I the very next section of Matthew, Jesus is being told by Peter, God will never allow you to be killed. And Peter is told, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. So that, that's your fourth reason, or third reason, if you will. The fourth reason is if I take you over to Second Peter chapter 1, or First Peter chapter 2, rather. Now, remember that this statement that I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound, not will be, future tense, will have been is the correct, that Peter's supposed to have the keys, Peter's supposed to be the foundation. All of these things are coming from, from these verses. I want you to look 
1 Peter chapter 2, and look at who Peter says is the foundation. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you are as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion, the, the idea of laying in Zion, a choice stone. This is talking about a foundation here, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. The precious value then is for those who believe, but for those who disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Who's the rock and the stone, according to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. In, yeah. In the book of Revelation, Brian, who has the keys to the kingdom? That's Jesus. Yeah. There's, no, there's not an apostle that those have been passed to. Jesus has the keys of the kingdom. Now, one other thing that I want to point out, and this gets to the idea of whether or not Peter was a Catholic and the other apostles were Catholic, is when Jesus says to him, upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus has already talked about another rock that you need to build on. And that's in Matthew 7, 24. He who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. What Jesus is telling Peter is that he has expressed something that had been revealed to him by God, but it had been revealed by use of that word rock because the Holy Spirit does not waste words, by, you, by the implication of that word rock that it had been revealed to Peter by the Father through what Jesus had taught. Can you think of some passages of Scripture where Jesus says everything that I'm saying to you comes from the Father? Uh, I can like, think of uh, one or two. Or dozens. Maybe like how many do we want to bring up? John, right. Yeah. Yes. John five. Maybe like all of John five. John. Everything from John fifteen going forward to eighteen. Literally dozens of passages that we can point at where Jesus either says or implies everything that he says in his doing comes from the Father. So ultimately, if Peter becomes the stone and the rock that we're to build upon. Jesus is contradicting what he said over in Matthew 7 and what Peter is going to say in 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, hopefully that, that was, I didn't get to spend as much time with that as I did in the Daily Bible Insight, but hopefully those statements are clear as to the implications that you have to draw from that. That Peter cannot have some special authority and dispensation that the other apostles don't have. Go ahead, Brian, I cut you off. No, I'm really excited about this. And I've even got my own list of things to consider too. One of them is, of course, really, yeah, you touched on some of them. So I have to alter this a little bit, but first and foremost, the whole concept of the authority of what is the cornerstone foundational concept of the church is that it has to be purchased with blood. This is Acts chapter 20, where he says that Jesus gets to be the cornerstone as he purchased the church with his blood. That's a constant statement throughout scripture that never, ever applies to Peter. That's not a Peter statement. That he, Peter doesn't purchase these things. Jesus purchases these things. Now, why is it that we think, why is it that someone would think Peter was given this authority in Acts chapter, in Matthew chapter 16, when ironically, Peter was not the first person to confess that Jesus was the Christ, the son of God. John chapter one tells us Nathaniel, the apostle, was the first of the apostles to confess that Jesus was the Christ, the son of God. And in mm -hmm. John chapter six, Peter says all of the apostles believe that Jesus was the Christ, the son of God. So right at mm -hmm. the top, why pick Peter? It can't be because of his confession, because they've already made that confession, which is super important. You get that confession about seven, six or seven times in the book of John mm -hmm. is a critical idea, but it's not that Peter made it or even made it first. Peter made it for everybody. And John chapter six could well be the same conversation as Matthew chapter 16. If so then Peter's not even speaking just for himself when he makes that. He's right. talking about everybody, which would make sense because the next thing is, Jesus says, I'm going to give you this authority. Whatever you bind on earth, I prefer the New American Standard on this, uh, shall have been bound in heaven. Uh -huh. In the next chapter, Jesus tells all of the apostles they have that authority. So in the next okay. chapter, the exact same authority that he's talking about with Peter is given to every apostle to bind on earth what had been bound in heaven. That they were, and of course, the implication being they were going to teach the things 
that God was delivering. That was going to be their authority. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, when it talks about the establishment of the church, puts all the apostles as key to that, as the deliverer. Yep. The apostles and prophets are the ones that are establishing that foundation. So there's and no even uniqueness there in or account. anywhere. Yes. Is there any time in the entirety of the New Testament where Peter exercises some kind of unique authority? The answer is no. In fact, in Galatians chapter 2, when he does something unique, he's rebuked for it. Uh, if Peter was the Pope, then whatever he said should go. But another apostle rebuked him and said, you're outside of the doctrine of Christ. That's the core. The truth of the matter is, and the Catholic Church wants to make the claim that the church gives us the scriptures. Therefore, the church is the core. But the Bible wants us to understand that the scriptures are the core that delivers to us the church, that gives us the things that can save us. The church doesn't save us. We receive with meekness the word uh, that that can save us. And the Catholic Church would want us to believe that it is the church that saves us. That's why they have the power right. of baptism. Wrong. Scriptures are the power of baptism. Scriptures deliver us the authority of communion. Scriptures give all these things. And that's the authority we have, not the church. Now, if the Catholic Church can reverse that and say, we even gave you the scriptures, then they can say, and we can control any other thing that is given by the power of the scriptures. If the Bible didn't exist for three centuries, then neither did the church. But we know the church existed from the get-go. So we know that the word of God was in existence from the get-go. Man, we could go a lot further on this, but I am out of coffee. Yeah. I'm going to put a link to that, that book that I mentioned, Why Does the Waters, an Amazon affiliate link in the description. Whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're looking at the podcast, that I'd recommend taking a look at it. I think it's available on Kindle. I'll put up both links if it is. But it's, it's definitely something that you're going to want to check out if you want to know more about John Wycliffe and William Tyndale, that their work in trying to bring the Bible to, to the common man is was really considered an affront to the Catholic Church. And we're going to do a lot yeah. more episodes on on different denominational things we're, that we've got some requests to do some episodes on Calvinism, some requests to do some more episodes on the Catholic Church. And we're, we've lined out a lot of that. That's not all we're going to deal with. We're also going to deal with some things that have to do with culture and the culture and times that we live in. So I think you're going to see a significant shift in terms of the kinds of things that we're talking about here on Biblically Speaking, because we're wanting to react to your questions and the things that you're asking us about. Brian, I'm going to give you the last word on this subject. Why don't you bring us home and then I'll sign us off. Is it possible that the Catholic Church gave us the Bible? I think probably the number one thing I would say is, if that were the case, wouldn't you think the Catholic Church would at least listen to the Bible? I don't think you can say it any more clearly than that. And over the, over the next several months, we're going to talk about some of the things that we see and in the Catholic Church and whether or not they are found in Scripture. And we've got a whole list of episodes that are part of that. And if you've got a question about denominations or a particular a doctrine that you have a question about, email us or leave it in the comments. We'll do an episode on it, even if it's one that you think that you might disagree with us on. We'll, we're willing to sit down and do an episode on it. Look, we appreciate all of you in the audience. Thank you for being here. Thank you for helping us grow. Be sure to check out the sister channel, The Man Up, the podcast where we're doing the 12-week, 12-question challenge to be better men. You want to check that out. If you want to follow our daily Bible insight videos and the long-form content that we do here on YouTube. But as always, from both Brian and I and all of our guests, everybody in the Biblically Speaking family, we want to say, have a good day and God bless.